Well, good morning. Pastor Bob isn't here. He's on the East Coast in New Hampshire. And you may have also noticed that Tanner's not here. <clears throat> he is also on the East Coast, but he is in Miami on his delayed honeymoon. So, if you see him next week and he's all red, make fun of him as much as you want to, because <clears throat> I certainly will. It's always funny when two of us are missing two staff members. It feels like we're, we're a band and we're missing our two front men. Kind of like going to a, a Beatles concert, but, you know, John Lennon and Paul McCartney just aren't there. You know, so since Tony plays the drums, he's Ringo. And uh, that, me, that makes me the other one that no one can remember his name. So, so there you go. That's where we're at. But anyway, let's do a, a mental exercise together. Remember back in the day, whether that was years ago or yesterday, I don't, it doesn't matter, uh, when you accomplished something or had something that you were so proud of, but later down the road, you realize, nah, that wasn't that great, or that wasn't that, that was, why was I even proud of that? Think of something like that. I'll give you an example from my own life. Uh, three days ago, we as a youth group went to Six Flags Great America which is a great place to go if you've never been. Uh, and it's interesting to see the different personalities that go on those trips. There are, there are some that go on one roller coaster right away, and then they say, yeah, I think, I think I'm done here. And they go, don't go on anything else the rest of the day. Or there are those who play arcade games most of the time. I won't look at anybody in this room, but there's someone here that did that. Um, and then there's some that are, go on roller coasters and they, they complain that they can't breathe on them, but yet they seem to talk the entire time they're riding that roller coaster. I don't get it, but that's what they do. And then there are those who are gung-ho, like, give me on every single ride as many times as we can. And to be honest, that is, did someone say amen to that? That's pretty funny. <laughs> that's me. I'm that guy. I want to be on every single ride, and I want to ride them multiple times. And one thing I was proud of back in the day was that one time I went to Six Flags, I rode the Batman roller coaster, which is my favorite one, five times in a half an hour because the park was closing and everybody was leaving, but that ride kept going, so I just kept on riding it, and I was so proud of it. So proud, in fact, that I even brought it up to the students this year, so it's still stuck in my mind. But when I look at it, really, and I look at other experiences in my life, you know, that accomplishment is, well, it's nothing, really. It's like, why... Why did I brag about that? I just riding roller coasters. I mean, it is on my resume, but <laughs> it's right there behind schooling and above, uh, you know, job experience. No, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. But could you imagine that interview? Oh, so I see here you rode the Batman ride five times in 30 minutes. You're hired, buddy. That's my dream right there. Anyway, but that often happens in life, you know. We get older, we, we see things that we used to be proud of or, or even accomplishments that we did that we used to be proud of, but then in comparison to other things in our life, they kind of lose their, their luster. They kind of lose, they lose that sense of pride. And Paul is going to talk about that today a little bit. That's one of the things that we're going to learn about in this passage. Um, so please turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. We are in a series called Joy on the Journey, if you didn't know, and the title of today's lesson is Rejoicing in a Changed Life. Rejoicing in a Changed Life. So if you are there, verse 1 is where we will start. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision, who worship the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind <clears throat> to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever, whatever things 
were gain to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them at but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the, right, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. All right, let's pray. Father, I ask that you would send your spirit to, to fill this room and that we would get what you would like for us from this passage. So please, Lord, we just simply ask to help us. It's in your son's name I pray, amen. All right, so when breaking this down, I broke this into three different sections. One isn't really a section, it's just one verse, but the other two are, are bigger. So the first one is just a short intro, but the second is gaining righteousness through works. And then the last section is gaining righteousness through faith. And one of these is correct, and one of these is incorrect. And probably many of you are ahead of me and know which one is correct and which one isn't correct, but we're going to go through this anyway. So, verse 1 starts with the word, finally. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. So this finally makes it sound like, hey, I'm almost done here. But anybody who's reading through Philippians knows, oh, this is just chapter 3. We're, we're only halfway. So it's either Paul is saying, finally, because of some other thing from chapter 2, or his conclusion is very long. Both of those are actually incorrect. Um, I don't know Greek as well as I used to, which was not that much anyway, um, and now I've lost it all. So in order to know what this finally means, I had to go to Warren Wearsby, and he says this finally means for the rest or furthermore, which is an introduction to a next section. The finally we think of when we think of the word finally in English comes later in chapter four, but we'll get to that in three weeks, I don't know. Anyway, so... Furthermore, Paul starts by saying something that he's been saying and will continue to say throughout the book of Philippians, this, this letter he's writing to the people at Philippi, the church at Philippi, and that is rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. It's like the motto of the entire book so far. That's why we've been, you know, all of our titles say rejoicing in something, finding joy on the journey. Paul is saying rejoice, people of Philippi. And the second part of chapter, or verse 1 says, To write the same things again, meaning the rejoicing things, is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard to you. He again tells the people to rejoice, and yet gives a warning to safeguard them. Of what? A warning of what? Well, verse 2 kind of lets us know of the opposition they will face. Earlier in the book, he talks about, Paul talks about opposition. But what kind of opposition? And that's where the second section of this uh, chapter kind of begins. It's gaining righteousness through works. So verse 2, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. Three different bewares, Paul tells them. Beware of the dogs, of the evil workers, of the false circumcision. And who are these people that he's talking about? Who are these people to beware of? Well, Bible scholars call those people today Judaizers. I don't know if you've ever heard that word before, and if you haven't, hey, it's your first time. Judaizers. From the beginning of the gospel, whenever the gospel came, it came to the Jews first. That's how Jesus taught it, and that's even how Paul himself says it. In Romans 1, verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So the gospel was always meant for the Jews first, and then, the, and then the Gentiles afterwards. And it's not until Peter shares the gospel with Cornelius, which we learned about a few weeks ago, a few months ago, I'm not sure of my timeline, and that all Christians before Cornelius were Jews or proselyte Jews, which was a Gentile who is converted to the Jewish faith. And when Paul goes on his witnessing journeys around uh, 
the Mediterranean Sea, he especially witnesses to Gentiles in his journeys. And this made a lot of the strict Jewish believers kind of upset with him. And they started to oppose him, saying, Gentiles need to be Jewish first. They need to be like us before they can be saved. That's what they were saying. And Paul was like, no, 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 that's not how it works. That's not how it works at all. And it became this big thing to the point where there was a conference in Jerusalem in Acts 15 where all the apostles came together and they talked about this and they figured it out. And uh, the, the apostles approved Paul's way of doing it. You don't have to become Jewish to be saved by Jesus Christ. But that wasn't enough for these, Jewish, these strict Jewish believers. So they would still, from time to time, follow Paul around in his missionary journey, trying to steal away the converts that he made. These were the Judaizers Paul was talking about. And Paul makes it very clear what he thinks about these people. He calls them dogs. They're dogs. And this isn't what we think of dogs in modern USA. The, you know, we love dogs, don't we? How many of you love dogs? Five of us. <laughs> they're cute. They're loyal. They're innocent. They destroy your kids' toys and poop on the floor. Uh, no, that's just one of my dogs. I'm a little bitter about it. Anyway, another thing I've learned about student ministry is that kids love dogs, too. All, the, all of my students love dogs, so much so that one of them, Madeline, I'm sure you know her from, anyway, she, uh, whenever I have something at my house, whether it's a game night or a movie night or something, she will come just to hang out with one of my dogs. And that's not a joke, because she said it to my face, I'm here for your dog. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's what it is. But anyway, that's not the term he's using here when he calls them dogs. Dogs to them are dirty scavengers that roam the streets. They eat dead animals. They, you know, get into the, the trash there. They're unclean. And they will probably attack you if you get anywhere close to them. Those are the dogs that, that Paul is referring to. And Jewish people of the time would call Gentiles dogs. Gentiles are unclean. They're scavengers and uncivilized. And so Paul, probably in, you know, a little bit of irony, but also a little bit of a backlash. He calls these Judaizers dogs instead. You are the dogs. And he also calls them evil workers. So these aren't just evil doers. They continually work at evil. They work for evil. And in Paul's context, these Judaizers may be doing good works. They might be doing works according to the law. But actually, what they're doing is evil because they're doing them in the flesh and not in Jesus, or not in the Spirit of God. And we think about ourselves today, do we fall into that sometimes? Do we do things that are good works, but we don't do them for God's glory? We kind of do them for ourselves? I would say yes, sometimes that is true. Good works do not save us. Pastor Bob has said that many times, and it's true. Good works do not save us. Good works don't save, but they are a result of being saved. Good works do not save, but they are a result of being saved. So it's where your mindset is when you are doing these good works. And number three, he calls them the false circumcision. Being circumcised does not make you righteous in God's eyes. Some translations call it the mutilation. Kapahal's using it ironically. You're just mutilating yourselves. You're not really doing it for God. All religious practices will not save you, whether it's circumcision or being baptized or tithing or going to church or even communion, which we just took, going to church. None of those things will save you, not by themselves. That's not what saves you, and we'll find out what saves us a little bit later, even though most of you probably already know. Paul says that Christians are the contrast to these Judaizers. Verse 3. For we are the true circumcision. They do it physically so that they can be seen as righteous, but we have circumcised hearts. We are the true circumcision because we have the faith. We have the, the belief. Who worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is our glory. It's not our works. It's not me doing things that I take glory in. It's Jesus that we take glory in. And put no confidence in the flesh. 
That's the opposite of what these Judaizers are. That's what we Christians are supposed to be. We are the true circumcision. We worship in the Spirit of God. We boast in Jesus, and we have no confidence in the flesh. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the Bible uh, doesn't talk very kindly about our flesh. From Genesis all the way through the New Testament. An example, Romans 7, 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. The flesh is not good. We put no confidence in our flesh. And I can just hear it now. People in those Judaizing camps are like, well, yeah, Paul, you say this because you're just using Jesus as a crutch. You never actually did any of this stuff, so you know, it's easier for you to do it that way. But Paul has a rebuttal for that right away. He knocks it out. Verse 4 through 6. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. So Paul is saying it right off the bat. If you think you have confidence in the flesh, guess what? I have it way more than you. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. So he's saying, guess what? I got all these things a lot more than you. On the eighth day, I was circumcised according to the law of Moses. I was born into this. I'm of the nation of Israel. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, which is something uh, to be proud of at his time. Benjamin had a lot of good things in the Old Testament that people can relate to. Benjamin was one of the favorite sons of Jacob. Why? Because he was a son of the favorite wife, Rachel. Benjamin also gave Israel their first king. Who was who? Saul. King Saul. Good. Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, was loyal to David when David was on the run from his son Absalom. Benjamin protected David. And also when the, when the nation split into two, Benjamin was the only tribe that stuck with Judah. All the other ten went north and they were a wicked nation. But Benjamin stayed with, with Judah. So that's something to be proud of for him. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Not only because I know I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, but all of these things. He says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, most likely meaning my, both of my parents were Hebrew people. And as to the law of Pharisee, we think of Pharisees today as, oh, hypocrites, why is he proud of that? But back then, Pharisee meant he is well-educated. He knows the law in and out. That is something to be proud of. He was as to the law of Pharisee, well-educated. And his zeal, he persecuted the church. Okay, that, what does that mean? Well, he was so zealous for the, Jew, uh, the Jewish faith that he would go out and try to stomp out any type of rebellion, any type of lie that he thought. So he would go after the church, this, this fake leader, Jesus, and he would try to stamp out his followers. That's how zealous he was. He was so dedicated to knocking out false false teachings. And this last one kind of makes me laugh because he's, and as righteousness to the law, he is blameless. That's how he, how he puts it. <clears throat> the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. I can just see him kind of doing this, like, yeah, I'm blameless. And these are all very prideful statements. They're very prideful statements, aren't they? And he says it. And to men... Especially Jewish men, these sound like good things. And some of them are. Some of them are very good things. But Paul was doing these things according to his flesh back then. And not in the spirit of God. So often as Christ followers, we fall into that kind of same trap. We look at the things that we have done or the things that we have. And we get a little boastful. Even when they are good things. Even when they are spiritual things, we get a little boastful. Oh, I led three people to... To Christ last week. Did you lead three people? Or was that the Holy Spirit? Or was that God? Oh, I worked for the food pantry. Or I worked at VBS. Or I worked at this. Okay, yeah, you did. But are you boasting in your work? Or are you boasting in the work that God did through you? Something to think about. And it's not like any of those things are, are bad to do. It's not like when Paul became a Christian, when, when Christ came to him, he said, okay, I guess I'm not going to be 
a Benjamin, a Benjamin anymore, or anything like that. All right, so this is where we, we, we switch over to the new thing. Starting in verse 7, gaining righteousness through faith. This is where the third section comes in. Verse 7. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Those things that were gained to him were only for him. He was a Benjamite. He was an Israelite. He was circumcised. He did this. He did that. They didn't bring glory to God because it was all selfish. It was all inward. And now he considers all of those things as loss. Paul is making a transition from one spiritual viewpoint to another, from following Judaism to following Jesus, and he counts all his religious works and his religious items as loss. They are no longer gain to him. But for us, it's not really a stretch to say things in a non-religious way in comparing them with Paul. What are some things that we count as gain for us today? Is it our jobs? I have a pretty sweet job. Is it our income? Oh, I got $600,000 this year. Uh, is it our families? Like, is it our degrees? Oh, I have a degree from Harvard. I have a degree from Moody. I have a degree from Yale or Trinity. Is it the things we own? Is it our, you know, our houses, our cars, our comic books? Is that just me? That's just me? How... Or how, you know, how awesome we were back in the day. Like, hey, I used to play basketball, and I was pretty good. You want to check tape? Because that's how good I was. But all of those things, they're not really religious things, but we count them as loss now. They are no longer gain to us. And it's not like any of those things are bad, like I said earlier. If you have a degree from Harvard or from Moody, those can be used to further God's kingdom, but that's what they need to do. They are not there. God did not grant you those things, give you those things, bless you with those things to boast yourself, to build yourself up. It's to further the kingdom. If you have a $600,000 income every year, that's great. If you use it for God's kingdom. So none of these things are bad in themselves. It's how we use them or what, where does our mind go? Do we boast in them for ourselves? Or do we give God the glory? Verse 8. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. Christ's value is above not only the things he was talking about, not only his spiritual things, but all things. And he counts all of those things as what? Rubbish, garbage, nothing, something to get rid of. And literally those things are not garbage, but in comparison to the overwhelming value that Jesus says, these things are garbage. And it reminds me of the parable of the pearl from Matthew. Matthew 13, 45 through, first, uh, through 46. Again, the kingdom, this is Jesus talking, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. Upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven here. But we can easily throw Jesus into that. Jesus is worth everything in our lives. The value of knowing Christ, and not just knowing about him. I know a lot about people even people I've never met before. I've never met George Washington, but I know a lot about him. That's not the knowing we're talking about here. Knowing is relational. Knowing is having that relationship with someone. So knowing Christ in a relationship is worth everything. And for Paul, he lost everything. He suffered loss, which means it wasn't easy for him. But that's okay. You know why? Because he considers them garbage. Even though it was hard for him to let go of things, even though it was hard for him to lose those things, it's okay because they're garbage in comparison to what he gained in Christ. At the moment of salvation, we all gain Christ right away, right? But Paul continues that, not, not just gaining Christ right away, but what is it called when you, what's, what's the term called when you continually look like, what? Sanctification, good. 
That's what Paul's talking about. We will continually to grow and be like Christ. We will continually gain Christ. And through that, we will continually lose things also. And that is fine. Paul says that is good. All these things are rubbish compared to Jesus. The more we gain Christ, the more we lose things that are rubbish. Our past gain is now loss in order to gain Christ. All those things that we were so proud of, even things that are, you know, legitimately good things, all those things we're proud of, they are rubbish. They are garbage in comparison to Jesus. Verse 9. And may be found in him. How do we do that, Paul? Not having the righteousness of our own derived from the law. So not the things that we do, but that which is through faith in Christ. And the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. It's not what we do. This has been hammered into you so many times. It's not what we do. We cannot gain our salvation. All of this is through faith. It is the free gift of God. And that is how we can be found in Christ. Verse 10. That I may know him, there's that relationship again, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. The Christian life is going to be full of sufferings. I don't want to break it to you if that's the first time you've heard of it, but it's It's true. If you're a Christian, you are going to suffer. Jesus warns about that. We may not suffer like Jesus did, but we will, like exactly like he did, but we will suffer in ways that he suffered. People are going to hate us. People hated Jesus. We will always have opposition because the dark hates the light. And sometimes giving up our lives and giving up those things can be painful. Paul said, I have suffered to lose these things. But again, he says, it's okay. Because it may be hard to give up those things. It may be hard to let those things go or count them as lost. But what we are gaining is so much more. So much more in Jesus. So finally, that's a callback. Finally, let's get to our applications. Number one, beware of those who would add to the gospel. That's what the Judaizers were doing. They were saying, hey, yeah, you know, Jesus is a great guy, but you got to be a Jew, Jewish person first before you can be saved. And there are people like that in our lives today. There are preachers like that. You know, the gospel is great and it's free, but it's not really free because you have to do all these things. Beware of people like that. The gospel is simple. It's so simple that a child can understand it. What is the gospel? You know, God loved us so much that he wanted us to be with him. And the only way to do that is to send his son down to be a sacrifice for our sins. And Jesus was that sacrifice. That's how simple the gospel is. I said it in three sentences. The gospel is simple, so beware of those who would add to it. Number two, pride is equal to the downfall of Christ's followers. We boast in the things we have and we boast in the things we do all the time, if we admit it or not, and we build ourselves up when we think highly of ourselves. And building ourselves up, that's what pride is. Pride is where sin started. Pride is thinking we know better than God or we don't need to follow God's plan or I can do it myself. Paul's pride and his religion, his religiousness, got in the way of what could have been his great joy, which was Jesus. And eventually it did get out of the way and Jesus found him. But Because of Paul's pride and his religiousness, he didn't know Christ for the longest time and he persecuted the church. Do not let religion in your own life or pride in your own life get in the way of your own joy. And the joy I mean is Jesus. Number three. Works in comparison to Jesus are nothing. Works in comparison to Jesus are nothing. Even good works. Good works cannot save us. Whether your works are are beneficial for you, other people, they're all nothing compared to what Jesus offers. And here's a quote from Warren Wiersbe to to close. I thought it was too good to, to not close with it. So here we go. There is only one good work that takes a sinner to heaven, the finished work of Christ on the cross. Isn't that the truth? 
All right, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for today. I thank you for your son, Jesus, and your great love for us that you sent him to die for us. We thank you that the gospel message is simple, and we thank you that we can easily just take that gift. We don't have to work for it. All of the works that we do are, are nothing. So please help us to, to change our attitudes when it comes to, to how we think about what we do and what we have and how our pride can get in the way that we think we've done these things. We got these things. We own these things. But really, you are the one who gave it to us and you are the one who should be glorified in our works. So please, Lord, as we continue on this week and the rest of our lives, help us to change our attitudes on that to not to take the glory for ourselves, but to give it to you and to your son, Jesus. And it's in your son's name I pray, amen.